Hi, I'm Jay Nordlinger with The Human Parade. We're in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the home, the study, of Mark Halperin, the writer. He leads a dual life, dual at least. What I mean is, he's a novelist and a journalist, if journalist is not too light or offensive a word. His novels include Winter's Tale, A Soldier of the Great War, and Memoir from Ant Proof Case. He has written three volumes of short stories, the latest of which is The Pacific and Other Tales. He has written three children's stories, or illustrated tales, the illustrator being Chris Van Alsberg. Critics have compared Halpern to the very most skillful and accomplished writers, including Joyce, Hemingway, and Nabokov. One of my favorite lines from any review comes from the Boston Globe's reviewer of Winter's Tale. He, meaning Mark, has simply galvanized the universe, exclamation point. In 2009, he wrote a book called Digital Barbarism, a Writer's Manifesto. This is one of those books labeled a bit lazily controversial. In the field of journalism, Halpern has written in pretty much all the top newspapers and periodicals on foreign affairs, defense policy, politics, and the culture, generally speaking. He was one of the first, maybe the first, to call for President Clinton's impeachment. And this was before the Monica Lewinsky scandal. In 1996, he served as advisor and speechwriter to candidate Bob Dole, and is believed to have drafted his convention speech. Norman Podhoritz called this one of the great American political speeches. Halpern went to Harvard, Oxford, Princeton, and Columbia. He served in the British Merchant Navy, the Israeli Infantry, and the Israeli Air Force. He's lived a little and written a little, or lived a lot and written a lot. And just by the way, Mark Halperin is not to be confused with Mark Halperin, the political journalist, but I bet they get each other's mail. Uh, do you? ever get mail for Mark Halperin? Are you ever confused with him? The post office uh, has much better taste than that. <laughs> I gotcha. Thank you for uh, having us, us the team, here in your home. And uh, it's uh, in the late uh, morning, and I wonder whether you've written any today. Are you, today? Someone, today? Are you someone who rises and writes automatically? Or? No, in fact, probably not even, not even this week. Uh, I have to clear the decks, and that's what I'm always trying to do, which is to get, to get everything out of the way before I have tranquility. And I have more tranquility than most people because I don't, for instance, I've never sent a text message. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't ever have uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter or anything like that. And generally, I keep out of the way. You know that here we are surrounded essentially by vegetation. There's nothing that you can see. You cannot see any, a work of man. We're on a farm or a ranch or what do we well, call it? It's a farm and it is a farm. It's with a horses. It's a working farm with right. uh, horses. We grow crops that we give to the Mennonites uh, and they have a, uh, uh, a home for retarded children and they, they take the hay and they feed it to the cows and they make cheese and ice cream and stuff like that and feed, which feeds the children. But f if you look out the window here, which you can't now because it's, ha it's hazy, you see eight miles away the mountains um, and you cannot see anything else, not even a telephone pole any, anywhere. Um, so it's uh, very tranquil here, and yet not tranquil enough for me to have written not only this morning, but even this week. Are you on, do you put yourself on a writing schedule when it's time to write? In other words, you're going to write from, let's say, nine to one, break for lunch. Do you, are you, um, are you regular and rigorous like that, or is it more when you feel like it, when you feel inspired? Usually, it's when I'm actually writing something, I get pulled along. It's like being, it's like sort of holding on to a freight train. I work in the morning. It takes about three hours, and the three hours pass like that. I never, I'm always surprised when I, it's usually three hours, three and a half sometimes. I look up at the clock and I say, What, you know, what happened to the clock? What, what, what did it do? Because it doesn't seem as if it's actually three or three and a half hours. And it, it, it's very nervous making, actually, because you know, where have I been? And sometimes uh, when I was young, um, well, can I tell you a story? Sure. Um, when I was 17, uh, I, I was in uh, France and I wanted to impress a girl in my high school who was a, a, an exchange student in Aix-en-Provence. And I rented a motorcycle and crashed on the motorcycle. And to make a long story short, didn't impress her and crashed on the motorcycle in addition as I was leaving. I was, I was badly injured, 
Hmm. And uh, I went to uh, Switzerland and then, then went to, to, uh, back to Paris, really, really very badly injured. To, re to recover in Switzerland, but I didn't recover, and then I went back to Paris. This is actually, I could tell you a story for an hour, but I'll compress it. In Paris, I stayed at the Hotel Gavarni. I said, I'd like a room, and the proprietor showed me a room, and I said, I can't take this room because it smells of burning rubber. He said, what? And I said, I'll show you the next room. Went up a flight. No, this room smells of burning rubber. Got up to the top floor. Every room smelled of burning rubber to me. It was horrible. And I finally took that room because they all smelled of burning rubber. He didn't know what I was talking about. Went and had dinner, came back to the room, and I, and I lay down on, on, the, on the bed, and I couldn't get up. I was in such pain. I was also, I became paralyzed uh, because I had this motorcycle crash and hit my head, I guess. And I thought I was going to die because I had great trouble breathing. I, I, w I was blind. I couldn't see, and I couldn't move. Age 17. Age 17. Okay. And I thought, well, this is it because I can't summon help or anything like that, and I'm just going to die. And it's a terrible trouble breathing. I thought, I'm dying. And the next thing I knew, it was the middle of the night, and I woke up, bang, like that. And suddenly, I was not only in perfect health, but for the first time in my life, I realized I was not in pain. I had been in pain all my life, and suddenly I was not in pain. I so I was born prematurely. I had spina bifida. I was very, very, very sick as a child, and I had had a headache all my life. Suddenly, I had no headache in this hotel room in Paris. So I got up and I looked at a, um, at the, I turned on the light next to the bed. There was a little table and it was a blotter. It was really white, and it didn't hurt my eyes. It didn't, and I, I felt as if I, I thought maybe I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and so what I did was I picked up a pen, and I began to write on the blotter. And I felt as if I were turning in circles and with no gravity. It was a wonderful feeling. I mean, it was like being in the space shuttle. It was up, you know, no gravity, just turning around. I had to hold on to the desk with my left hand as I was writing. It was a, it was a great thing. And I said, well, you know, what the hell is this? What am I? And I went back to bed. I got up in the morning, and, I, and I, I felt so terrific for the first time in my life. And I looked at what I had written on the blotter, and it was really beautiful. And I said, I wrote that? How could I have, I was 17 years old, I said, this is like what we read in books. This is what writers, that's how, that's how I became a writer. I decided to do that for the rest of my life. Um, to what do you attribute this recovery in this room that I think there was like something, something that ha when I was born, I was born in very difficult conditions. I was two months premature in 1947. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was something that had happened to my brain that got jiggled when I had my motorcycle accident. That's the only thing I can think of. I, I want to say something about your, uh, your books, your novels. Uh, something occurred to me when I was looking at the cover of Digital Barbarism, which is not a novel. But um, you may have heard the story, maybe even from me, but it's about uh, Richard Strauss, the composer. And at the end of the war, he was in Garmisch, Germany. Uh, the American Pardon, soldiers. Garmisch, and kill him? Yeah. Yes, they were joined together when, when Hitler had the Winter Games there in 36. Um, Strauss and Garmisch. And so uh, here come the American soldiers or officers and Strauss has been involved with some things maybe he shouldn't have been involved with. And he greets them at the door with, I am Herr Dr. Richard Strauss, composer of Salomander Rosenkavalier. And I've often quipped, well, I'd have said Electra, <laughs> you know, my, my, but those are the two he chose. And on your book it says, uh, on digital barbarism, on the cover, it says, Mark Halperin, author of Winter's Tale and a Soldier of the Great War. Two books among a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, are those books that, uh, maybe it was a publisher's decision, but that for you stand out? And would you announce yourself that way? You know, I am Herr Dr. Mark Halperin, uh, author of Winter's Tale and a Soldier of the Great War. Those two books, uh, probably a publisher's decision because Winter's Tale sold millions of copies. And millions? Yeah. Millions. In paperback. You know, and, wow. And therefore, that's how I'm best known because of that. They assume that anyway. And Soldier of the Great War uh, also did quite well, not, not, not as well as that. Um, if I had to choose, I'm, to get your drift, if I had to choose what book to put on my, my tombstone, mm -hmm. uh, I would say The Pacific. Which is the title short story of a collection of short stories. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I mean, you, you must never take the uh, uh, advice of a writer about his own work. Yeah. But if I had to, I, I would say that's, that's my I think I mean, best book. By the way, I think that um, the, the, the Pacific is maybe my most given book, the, the book I've most given. Oh, so you others. agree, yeah. It's my go-to gift book, often has been for some years now. Not that the others aren't worthy. You, you lead me to ask an, an indiscreet question. Did there come a time in your writing career when you had made enough money from writing that you could just be Joe Independent, you could write when you wanted, whenever it struck you to write, and write what you wanted when you were set because you were successful enough? Yes, it was uh, before I even started. Because, not because I'm independently wealthy, which I'm not, uh, I, the money that I have, I made, but when I was very poor, I made that decision and I did that. I, I, I've only taken one advance in my life. The advance was because uh, when our second child was born, she, uh, we were told that she had a congenital heart defect and that she would have to have major open heart surgery. And our first child at that point was, was uh, hooked up to a, what was called a nebulizer because she had severe asthma. So we had these two infants who were in, in, we thought were in terrible health. As it turns out, they're in great health. The, the second child did not have a congenital heart disease. It was a misdiagnosis. Uh, thank God they're, they're in, they were in wonderful health shor shortly thereafter. But at the time, we thought, uh-oh, we have this problem, we have to take care of them. And that's the only time in my life I've ever taken advance on a book, and that was quite late. Um, I, I had never taken advance uh, in, the, in the very beginning because I, I always, always wanted to do exactly what you said, which was to be completely independent, uninfluenced, uninfluenceable by either publishers or the market or critics or reviews or anything of that sort. So in the very beginning, what I did was I decided that I would never take an advance, and I didn't. So I've worked a million jobs of all types, uh, and I still do that kind of thing, although uh, on my own property mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, until I was 33, I didn't get off the cycle of doing things like um, washing dishes. Now, I was 33 years old, and my classmates at Harvard were investment bankers, doctors, lawyers, uh, big deals, and they, they had lots of money and everything. I was washing dishes in, in the Liberty Mutual cafeteria, an in, in insurance company in Boston. I was loading and unloading trucks, working as an agricultural worker, working as a security guard, work, doing all kinds of things. One like can that. see all these things in your novels. I, I, I believe that one should do these things. It's kind of a cross between Chairman Mao, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom and go out into the countryside, and not that I'm a Maoist. I think you and I are great supporters of communist China. So yeah, yeah, right. And uh, Chairman Mao and Eric Hofer, you know, the stevedore who was a philosopher, and, uh, and Wendell Berry, uh, you know, whatever. But the, my point is that if you don't do those things, then you miss out of a lot. You miss out in a lot of life. I was poor. I had to work at these things, but I was free. So no publisher ever said, well, you've got to change this character into a dolphin, you know, and we put it in the South Seas and do that. They never, they never could do that because I would present them, always still, present them with a finished book. And the... the, the um, take I, it or leave it? Take it or leave it. It is, it is accepted when you buy it. I will work on it editorially because you can always improve, and I like to do editing, but, but it's, it's accepted when you buy it so that I have what they call in Hollywood, last cut. Hmm. Um, you know, our old friend, my boss, Bill Buckley, did a great variety of writing, as, as you do. And he would say that his re readerships, if you will, did not overlap. There were people who read his uh, political column and people who read his spy novels and people who read his sailing books and his political books, people who watched his television show. But he said the readerships didn't, he, he said there were, were different readerships, he said. And people who read the spy novels or the sailing books didn't want anything to do with politics. Do you have uh, novel readers who don't read your political articles and so on? Do you, do you have readers and fans uh, as a novelist, uh, people who don't think much of your politics, but concede your literary gifts and enjoy you anyway? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I don't know the proportions or the numbers, but I frequently run into this. 
I run into at, at, at book signings or speeches, um, someone will come up to me and, and say, how can someone as blah, blah, blah as you, you know, complimentary stuff before the, the blow, uh, be a Republican? See? And I, this at first shocked me. And this is a common thing. You know, how could you, someone so blah, blah, blah be a conservative? How can you be? And what, what I, I, I respond to this in this way. My father was a Democrat, although he was a Democrat in the mode of Harry Truman, which is in a sense to say a Republican these days. Uh, and Certainly in foreign policy. Yeah, well, in foreign policy and social policy. Truman, by the way, in the late 60s was horrified by the, 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 uh, the, all the nonsense of the 60s and the way that the Democratic Party was moving. This, by the, this should be a book. You, you in the met Truman when you were a kid. I met Truman I don't want twice. To up twice. When uh, you were a kid. When I was a small child, my father introduced me to him on Madison Avenue. My father had had been acquainted with him. My father worked for uh, Roosevelt and, and Churchill, but, and so he was barely acquainted with Truman. He stopped him as he was walking down Madison Avenue. Truman had a Secret Service man in front of him and one in back of him. And that's it. And he was and he walked at a very fast clip. And he was walking in Madison Avenue. I remember this. I was a little boy. My father said, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, he introduced himself and he said, this is my son and I remember meeting Harry Truman. So my father was a, was a Democrat. He never voted Republican in his life. I love my father and uh, therefore when, someone, when a man comes up to me and says that, I think, well, he's like my father. I'm not going to chop his head off. I'm not even going to argue with him. So I'm just nice to him and, and that's that. But some people are very nasty about it very nasty and there are bookstores that say I wouldn't I wouldn't sell his book I wouldn't carry his book or uh, you know some very nasty things on the internet where people are not civil yeah. then it gets really it gets really really bad and sometimes a reviewer will discover uh, that I am not a liberal democrat and punish me for it although I don't want to whine about it and whine a little it's all right I hate don't them. Tell the truth. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, it's terrible. They mark it's, you down for your politics. They, yeah. they don't judge your novels on novelistic terms necessarily. No, oh, yeah, uh, well, huh. here's a good example, although it was a very good review. Thomas Keneally. Good meaning favorable or favorable. well written? Okay. Both, both. Thomas Keneally reviewed A Soldier of the Great War on the front page of the New York Times book review. And in the first sentence, he told, told his readers that I was a Republican. That's now, to establish his own humanity. I don't know what it's to say, but here we have a book it's about... It's to show that he is good and you are bad, well, but nonetheless... I, I don't know what his motivations mm -hmm. were or how it c came out, but here's a book about an Italian soldier in the First World War, and the reviewer, in the first paragraph of a long review, has to state, has to warn, it's like scare quotes, has to warn the readers of the uh, New York Times book review that I'm a Republican. What does it have to do with anything about the book? So that, that's the kind of thing that I, that I mean, although it was an excellent review. But you've, um, you've soldiered on, so to speak, as a novelist anyway, and flourished. Is, is Morrison uh, talented? You know, I've never read any of her books. Is uh, John Irving good? I've never read any of his books either. You can go down the list. I'm going to go answer. down this list. Yeah. You've, ne you've never read a John Irving novel? Never. Ever read a John Updike novel? No. I, 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 know, I knew John Updike, but you know, a little bit, and certainly um, I knew John Cheever. These, these were, they were very close, and we knew John Cheever as a family friend, and I, and I met Updike on many occasions, uh, but I've never, I've, never read, I've never read John Cheever, and he was, he was such a close friend of my family that uh, I'm sure he's turning over in his grave to know that. Philip Roth? Never. Norman Mailer? I, I read uh, The Naked and the Dead when I was a kid. Did you like it? I read it because it had the, the, the word naked in it. Yeah, right. And, uh, but it was very disappointing in I'm, that respect. W w why, don't, why don't you read these, these novelists and these novels? Well, Is it I'll tell you why. You see all anxiety those, of influence? No, no, no. Well, p partially, partially. You see all those books there? Yeah. It's t I'm 64 years old. It's taken me a lifetime to read those. And some of them at the end, I don't know if you can see them on camera, but I wrote a lot of them. Uh, I read very slowly, really slowly. Um, my friend uh, Sam, Sam Schulman, whom you know, mm. uh, will read several books a week. Oh. There, there are people like that. Uh, some people read a book a day, literally. literally. Full of envy. I, I can read a, a normal-sized book. 
uh, in, in about two or three months. Part of it is that I read so slowly and I check everything and think of everything. Every single footnote. How, that must torment you. No, I like that. Really? Yeah, but it limits how much I can read. When I was a, a student and a graduate student, uh, I was forced to read in, in great volume. And I did, and partly that's a result of it, the shelf you see in back of us. Mm. But, but now that I'm on my own and, I, and no one is telling me what to read, I follow my nose, I read what I read, and I read, for example, I don't know if you can see it back there, but the, the great Martin Gilbert um, mm. biography of Churchill. Yeah. It's 10,000 pages long. And uh, I read every single page, every single footnote, and calculate every footnote. For instance, if, if, if I read in a footnote that somebody did something on such and such a date, I will go back and, and figure out how old that person was, because that's important in the context. Mm -hmm. uh, if I see a contradictory statement or whatever, I'm, I, essentially I, I, I copy edit the books that I read, and it takes me a long time. That's number one. Number two, uh, I am influenceable. For instance, there's a great Scott Fitzgerald story which starts out with the line, th the words, that jonquil, you see. Now, to me, just hearing those two words, that jonquil, that's enough for me. I can then go, I could go and write a story that that, that would put me in the frame of mind to write. That's a daffodil, more or less, isn't it? I don't a know. Jonquil. It's a flower. Yeah. yeah. I don't know much about flowers. My wife knows about flowers. I was sick for botany. <laughs> right. And, and f the female reproductive system and evolution and logarithms. Go ahead. There'll be no quiz. Yeah. Um, I'm not equipped to give one anyway. Uh, so you, you read slow. Do you write slow or fast? I don't know. Uh, it's compared to uh, yeah, um, right. Good Baudelaire, <laughs> slow. Uh, compared to, to um, uh, some certain poets, fast. I mean, but I'll tell you exactly. Uh, about, about, five pa about let's see, five pages in my, I write it in longhand, uh, always in longhand. I'll do uh, four or five drafts in longhand before I put it in the word processor. And I do about two and a half or three single space pages a day. That's about 1,500 words a day. That's mm -hmm. the answer. That's a precise answer. When writing fiction? I think that's a lot. I think 1,500 words a day is well, a Thomas, nice cracking Thomas, pace. You know, someone told a story about uh, hearing Thomas Wolfe when he lived in Brooklyn Heights. He was walking along the street, and he didn't know that they were listening. They were in a window above him, and he was saying, I wrote 10,000 words today. I wrote 10,000 words today. So he could do 10,000 words, but then again, it shows. Hmm. I wonder why there are so few conservative novelists, and by that I mean novelists uh, whose politics are, are right-leaning. Uh, there's um, Tom Wolfe, as distinct from Thomas Wolfe. Um, there's a man named Mallon. Correct. Right. And, and there's you. I imagine there's some who are closeted. Oh, well, look at, look at what happened to Updike. When I was in... Uh, For uh, semi-defending the Vietnam War? Well, not semi. Uh, I was a, uh, a student in college, and there was a, a book that came out. It was, a, it was a compendium, and they'd ask all these various cultural figures to write about the Vietnam War. It's very much like the, the uh, Daedalus book um, that came out. Um, about about what, what they called Star Wars, you know, about the Strategic Defense Initiative. Ted which, Kennedy called Star Wars, and it right, stuck. Right, it stuck, which had Bob not, Schramm, a, think, not yeah. a single pro-strategic uh, defense article in it, and it was supposed to be an analysis of it. Well, this Vietnam War book came out. They, all these cultural figures were commenting on the Vietnam War. The only person who supported the war, and he wasn't semi-supporting, he, was, he supported it, mm. was Updike. And the next thing that happened was that his novel, Couples, came out. And you, <laughs> that was like a, uh, it was like the, you know, the dunking pool. Uh, he, he and he was the one being dunked. That, I don't, I haven't read it. Maybe it was no good. I don't know. But I think it probably wasn't uh, no good. It was probably at least okay. But it was treated as if it were Heinrich Himmler's uh, yeah. <laughs> manifesto. Yeah. yeah, it was because because of that. So Updike went underground after that. Uh, he he had to for for survival. I I didn't go underground. I've never went underground. I just uh, you know why? Can I tell you why? 
I assume you don't give a damn. No, I give a very much of a damn, and I have a family to support and everything like that. And I, I would like to uh, win uh, more prizes and, and get some honorary degrees and, and have more money, you know, just like anyone else. But I'll tell you why. I'm surprised. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I'm hum I, I, human. I, 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 I've always considered you sort of not human in that well, way. Well, I'm not human either, but in other ways. My, my wife says I'm not human. When I answer the phone, uh, we don't have an answering machine, of course. Of course. So when people say, can I call you, I say yes. But we don't have an answering machine. We don't have voicemail. So speak to, uh, make sure that you speak to a human or me. Oh. See, I say that. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you why I yeah. do this. Uh, when I was a senior in college, uh, I, I, had, uh, I, I got caught up in the anti-Vietnam War uh, frenzy. And I thought that it was my job not to go to Vietnam because I thought it was a, 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 an illegal war and a war that shouldn't have been fought at that time. And, and yet, uh, I used to go to the Mount Auburn Cemetery to work in, in Cambridge. In fact, I would sit in the, in the I mean, James you, plot. You didn't work in this. You've had so many strange jobs. No, no, I mean to, to study, to study gotcha. and to write. Uh, in fact, I wrote my, my uh, uh, first and second stories that I published in The New Yorker in, in the Mount Auburn Cemetery, Jeez. sitting on the grave of, of Henry James. And William James is right next to him. Uh, in the James plot, it was because there was a, there's a big sort of bedstead uh, headstone in the James plot, and it faces pretty much south. Mm. And when it was cold, you'd sit against it, and you could be warm. But anyway, uh, once I was, uh, in, in this period, I was there. And ac across the way from the Mount Auburn Cemetery, where the aristocrats are buried, Mary Baker Eddy and the Jameses and stuff like that, uh, is a regular cemetery. And I was sitting there once, and there was a burial for a boy who had been killed in Vietnam. And I watched. I watched his parents uh, and the, uh, the, the priest and, mm. and all. And uh, excuse me, I don't believe in uh, being emotional on camera, but I was uh, very moved by that. And I went and I looked at the at the at the the gravestone hadn't been engraved but there was a piece of paper and everything and I saw that he was a PFC he had been killed in Vietnam and I thought to myself uh, maybe he took my place see because I mm. didn't go mm. and that's why I volunteered later I tried to join the Marines but I couldn't because my eyes I went to the Israeli Army and Air Force because I wanted to do my part and not to let someone else die in my place but since that time uh, I have thought that I owed the defense of the country anything that it might require of me. Uh, my, my family had 32 people uh, who, were, who fought in World War II. There's a picture in the hall of one who, who, who didn't come back. It was my cousin Robert. He died in his B-25. Uh, my, my, since we got here right after the Civil War, we fought in every war in, of America from, from uh, the Spanish-American War First World War with my uncle Red was a cavalryman with Pershing. Uh, Korean War, except Vietnam War. I was, some of them may have, but I didn't. It was my war to fight. I didn't do it. And I thought to myself, I owe them my life. I owe these soldiers uh, my life, those who died. And I owe the country in terms of the defense that I didn't give it my life. Therefore, uh, I advocate a strong defense for the country, and I do so I hope, uh, reasonably and logically, not just as a, you know, as, as a, as a thing to do, but I only uh, follow the truth of the matter. And any consequence that follows upon me is bearable because I'm still alive, you see. So, I, so in a sense, you say, I don't, I don't give a damn because I have a, a, a higher threshold that I'm thinking of here. So if, I, if my career is interrupted or my... Uh, um, I, I don't have the, uh, the same income, or I'm frustrated, or whatever. It doesn't matter, because uh, what what I owe is my life. Mark, you um, you went into the Israeli military, mm -hmm. and there's a this radioactive phrase that we're all familiar with: dual loyalty. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel a dual loyalty? Uh, yes, to some extent. But having been in the Israeli army and Air, and Air Force. Um, I had to deal with the question and think about it in, in depth, unlike most people who don't think about it in depth because they don't have to. 
And first of all, when you do that, there, there was a Supreme Court decision called a Freud versus the United States in 1968, where the Supreme Court affirmed that you can fight in a foreign army as long as you don't fight against the United, take up arms against the United States, and you don't lose your citizenship. So the Supreme Court has said that it's perfectly fine to join a foreign army as long as it's not fighting the United States. It doesn't imperil your citizenship. I would not have joined the Israeli army had I not done that. Now, granted that before, before that, and part of the, the precedent for the Supreme Court was that, you know, for instance, Faulkner served in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, Hemingway served in the Norton Hargis uh, Ambulance Corps. Um, there were the, there were the uh, Eagle Squadron in, in World War II, Americans serving in the RAF. There was the Lafayette Escadrille, Americans serving in the, in the French Air Force before we entered the war in World War I. There was the Flying Tigers fighting for China. This is a common thing for Americans to do. The only time that dual loyalty is brought up is when it's a Jew fighting for Israel. No one ever says anything about the Lafayette Escadrille or, or, or the, uh, the, the Flying Tigers or the Eagle Squadron. No one ever said anything about dual loyalty there. But and You consider Israel part of the liberal and free West. West yeah. not in a geographic sense, but in a political, civilizational one. Yeah, and also, you know, just as a Jew, uh, I'm, I'm not going to let it go down mm. uh, if I have anything to say about it. But f to continue on to in, in, uh, my line of thought, I was forced, uh, by the way, before you go in to the Israeli army, you go to the American, at least I did, went to the American embassy, and I took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, uh, a, a solemn oath, just as if I were sworn into the military or into political office. You take that oath and you affirm the primacy of your citizenship to this country. And the, and the American embassy ha knew that I was going to serve in the Israeli army. I took that oath, et cetera. So I consider that it's all, I mean, it's a proper word, perhaps kosher. And in making these decisions, in doing all this stuff, I also had to decide which country came first, you see. Now, a lot of American Jews haven't made that decision. And, and because they haven't, I guess they haven't been forced to it. I was forced to it. I had to decide because you can't have, it's like having, being in love with two women. Mm. Uh, you have to make a decision. And I decided then, even when I was serving in the Israeli army, that America was first. It, it was, it, th this is my country, not Israel. Israel America was, first, there's a slogan. Yeah. <laughs> As a real, Lin, I'm a Lindbergian. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. So, so that's the, that's the, the um, a lot of American Jews haven't made that decision, and they will, for example, vote according to what's best for Israel. I would never, ever do that. Uh, as much as I, as I um, uh, love and support Israel, I vote in terms of what's best for America. It is my obligation to do so. On the subject of Israel, I've asked a, a number of our guests this question, kind of an unfair question and a, and a brutal question, but one to face. Uh, do you think Israel will survive? No. I didn't think so. Uh, when was I in the army? It was, uh, it was almost 40 years ago. I mean, first 67, 73. Oh, well, are, are Israel's enemies too strong? Are its friends too few and too weak? Why, why, why do you have this feeling? I have this feeling because of, uh, it's, a, it's a military engendered feeling. Israel has virtually no strategic depth. It has three cities, uh, mainly Tel Aviv, but also Jerusalem and, and, and Haifa. Uh, it, it could be wiped out as uh, the so-called moderate Iranian president, Rafsanjani, has said, one nuclear weapon takes it out. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Whereas they can only make a dent in the Ummah, he went on to say. Well, they can make more than a dent in the Ummah. Israelis. And, yes, and believe me, they will. They will not go down. I don't believe that. I've never believed in the Samson option. I don't think it's true. I don't think it'll ever happen. You don't? I, I don't. I, I think I'm one of those who believe that the, the Israeli nuclear arsenal is, is unusable because they'll never strike first. They'll never strike and, first. And, and, no. and, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. and if all's lost, mm -hmm. I can't imagine Israeli statesmen sending nuclear weapons to kill millions of innocent people You're wrong. for no reason. You're wrong. Why? Why? I just can't imagine that order would be given. It would be given just the way it would be given in the United States. Is, and, and the only Reagan reason, wouldn't have done it. That's why he was so gung-ho on SDI. No, Reagan would have done it. <laughs> Any American president, president would do it. You know why? 
because if you, are, if you have not made up your mind and set yourself into stone to do this horrible thing that would kill millions of innocent people, then what you are doing is asking to be wiped out yourself. The, the, what you're talking about is the very basis of deterrence. You cannot deter an enemy in, in, the, in, the, in the nuclear fashion, in the, in the nuclear uh, um, strategic calculus. You cannot deter an enemy unless you are willing to do the unthinkable. Are the Iranian mullahs deterrable? No. Yeah. No, and that's part of the reason that, that, that I'm saying this. Uh, and, and believe me, Israel, if Israel is destroyed with nuclear or even biological weapons, uh, Israel will take its revenge. What, what will it say about the, us? What will it say about the world, civilization? Let's get grand. Mm -hmm. If Israel is, let me put it this way, allowed to go down. Well, it wouldn't, be the, it wouldn't, be, the, wouldn't be the first time. Uh, it would be the second time. Good point. Yeah. And what, and what would it say? It was a long say? wait. Yeah, it was a long wait. And this, these are things that are of, they are of such a grand scale, it's very hard to say anything sensible about them. I mean, it's the kind of thing, it's like a, uh, like a tsunami coming at you. There's very little that you can say or do or, or think about it. Uh, something like that that would happen. Uh, the, the deaths of millions as they occur uh, now and then, it's not something that you can really make sense out of, you know. It, who, who was it that is, is Henry Adams said, in any great crisis, no one is ever right. Uh, and that's, that's, that's true. No one's ever completely right. You, you do some journalism, a fair amount of journalism. Too much. Do you regard it as, in a sense, uh, the title of your <coughs> column in the Wall Street Journal, your regular column, was or is written on water? That was for the uh, electronic version, which I didn't want to do. And they said, oh, you know, we'd like you to do it. Like, I said, all right, I'll try it. And, but it's only provisional. And I really didn't like it because it is written on water. I don't like electronic um, anything. Yeah, is that phrase a coinage of yours? Is it written on water? I think so. Yeah. But, but that has to do not with, not with journalism, not with the ephemeral nature of journalism, no. but with the medium of the Internet? That's correct. That's correct. Well, I, but, but Mark, what difference does it make, whether it's online or, or, or in print? I'll tell you what difference it makes. First of all... Um, when the paper doesn't yellow online, it doesn't burn, it's there to be retrieved. Where, where is it? Not sure. Uh -huh. okay. But it's retrievable. It, I just, you know, tappy-tap. For, forever? And, don't know. No. Here, here's the, here are the several things. One, um, you're familiar with the great Soviet encyclopedia, that they, they would send out uh, pieces of paper to paste over mm. pages if they, according to the polit politics of the day. People they wanted to take out or put in, or change history, or whatever. And uh, the great Soviet encyclopedia, if you, see, you can see where it's pasted over, uh, where, where they've sent out new things to be pasted over. Mm -hmm. So you know to be wary of it. And you, possibly even a conservator could unpaste it and see what they said beforehand. Also, if you have paper, it's in for instance, um, generally, if I, if I have a book, it's in... Excuse me, but can I just remind you of a joke, a great yeah, old joke? Actually, ahead. I think it was a, an actual incident. The, um, uh, an historian from the Soviet Union is attending some international historians' conference, and, and they're, they're, they're trying to predict the future, and these historians are asked by someone, some moderator, uh, to predict the future. And they get to him, this Russian in the Soviet Union, he says, predict the future. He says, we can't even predict the past, right? <laughs> just for the reason you say. Okay. Sorry, this is a little comedic interlude. That's a good interlude. Yeah. But you, you, if I write a book, I know it's in at least 10,000 libraries, see? And it's a piece of paper, it's immutable in, in 10,000 libraries. If someone wanted to change what I said in that book, or what anyone wants to say in a book, to, to, to Soviet style, wipe it out, they can't do it because you could always find it in a library where it hasn't been done. You know, and it'll be in, in someone's personal library. It'll be in other libraries. It'll be, it's there and it's set. Uh, if it's in Google's archive, it can be changed. That's the, one, that's the major complaint I have about this, is that it is subject to manipulation. That's very, very dangerous. Uh, there is nothing to prevent that. That's number one. Number two, in an EMP, which means electromagnetic pulse, all that stuff could be wiped out. I don't know to what extent Google, which has centralized information, electronic information, 
uh, has shielded their servers. I don't know. But if there's an electromagnetic pulse and these servers are not shielded according to MILSPEC, military specifications, for against, against electromagnetic radiation from a nuclear explosion, everything will be wiped out, just like that. It'll be gone. It's centralized, which is dangerous. Even if it's shielded by, with, with leading and stuff, uh, the building could be destroyed. Okay, so they say, well, we have backups. We have 10 buildings. Well, 10 buildings are easy to destroy. Uh, it's, it's putting your eggs in one basket, it's manipulable, and it's not readily available. Mark, every day that you write an article on some issue of the day, defense policy or whatever, does it take, it takes away from the time you have to That's write right. enduring literature. That's right. And, I, and I, yet you consider, let's call it journalism, worth bothering with because you have things to say, things to tell people. That's right. And I, and I also try to set, I, I thought when I was 60 I would stop and just write you know, because after all, I mean, how long do I have left? I don't know, but it, my father died, my mother died when they were 80. Uh, my other close relative, uh, my, my father's brother, died when he was 80. So if I have 16 years left, uh, what I'd like to do really is just write short stories, maybe a novel or two. But I, I get pulled back into it. I had planned to, to make the switch when I was 60, but I keep on doing it, and maybe I'll stop in a, in a year or two. But you're right, there's, there's a competition between the two things. Uh, let's talk about politics a little, or a little more. I, um, I know you're a hawk, a security hawk. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman Padoritz calls me super hawk. Okay. Um, eagle, even. Uh, but are you also a free marketeer? Yes. Uh, but perhaps not as much as, I mean, not laissez-faire, uh, the, the market has imperfections, which uh, have to be regulated to some extent. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I believe that um, the, the allocation and use of money, which someone earns by the sweat of his own brow, uh, or even, even if he's lucky enough uh, as a rentier, because he's inherited the money or whatever, should be, should be is best directed by that person himself. It's more efficient. Uh, and it's also, there's a moral dimension to it, too, which is, uh, does one have the right, actually, to take away someone's, someone's uh, wealth simply because uh, y you decide to do it and you want to spread it around, as the president says? Uh, I would say no. Are you a, a so-called social conservative? Yes. Uh, You're an all-around conservative. You're a Reaganite, I think I am, yes. I guess. Yeah, oh, yeah, I am. I mean, so social conservative meaning that I... Um, I'm not happy with the, with the present uh, state of the American people. Uh, and that doesn't make me a Grinch, because I, I, what I, I, I look back and I see certain things that I remember times that I was happy about. And may I expand upon that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, first of all, I find that when I, when I speak to certain people and I say, well, I remember when it was better, they say, yes, but there was racism. That's true and we worked to get rid of it. You know, I myself did. I'm not going to go into that, but I did. I was part of that. And, and, but if you say to them, for example, uh, well, in, in the 1940s, there was tremendous uh, union membership, much higher than today, which is what they would value, because yeah. they, they want that. They don't then say, yes, but there was racism. <laughs> you say, one has nothing to do with the other. So when I remember back, and I say, in, in, in Dole's um, uh, convention speech, uh, he said uh, something like, I remember it was better then. I re let me be a bridge to the past, which, by the way, Clinton then, then stole and, and, and changed and said, let me be a bridge to the future, which, of course, is absolutely it's total nonsense because you don't know what the future is. You can't be a bridge. But the past, you know. You can take the best from it and, 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 and preserve it. This is what conservatism really is in, in many senses. We've got about 10 minutes, and I'd like to ask about five or six quick ones. Mm -hmm. You're glad Bill Clinton was impeached, but he uh, made it through. Mm -hmm. It was pretty popular when he left office. It's pretty popular now. Right. He said upon leaving office, he gave a so-called exit interview, and he said, you know, I've demystified this job. The president used to be on a pedestal. The president ought not to be on a 
pedestal. And I've demystified the job, and that's a good thing. Uh, you and I think that's not such a good thing. Yeah, well, I just have to say that um, uh, I wrote my column called Impeach, which uh, then stirred up all the, um, the conservative radio people. That stirred them up, and that really started the movement. Uh, I actually wrote the impeachment resolution, which was then much changed by, the, by, by Congress, but I wrote the first draft of it. Um, way before Monica Lewinsky, when Monica Lewinsky came along, uh, I was deeply depressed because I knew that he would escape because that's not, it, it might be technically an impeachable defense, but it, politically it wouldn't have got it. I wrote the, I, I just had, was involved in the impeachment resolution because the president gave special waivers which allowed China, which allowed Hughes Aircraft and Laurel to teach China uh, how to aim missiles at an orbital aim point, which mean, meant that it was accuratizing their intercontinental ballistic missiles in order to hit the United States. He allowed that when the State Department, the Defense Department, the Commerce Department said, don't do it. It's against the security of the United States. He allowed that. And at the same time, he was receiving, and the Democratic Party was receiving, literally millions of dollars. And that's what we know about, because they like to do it. The Chinese do it in cash, in suitcases. But what we know about, millions of dollars in, in campaign contributions from, from China while he was doing that. That's what I thought was impeachable. Not one senator went to the evidence room to look at the impeachment stuff. Uh, I was there. I, I was at the trial. I was watching the whole thing. Um, and uh, I, I knew that when Monica Lewinsky, Lewinsky came up, Clinton must have danced when that happened, when they shifted it to Monica Lewinsky. That was the end of the whole thing. The issue was his behavior vis-a-vis -vis China and giving it the technology that, that enabled it, has enabled it to make its uh, missiles a accurate and the fairings on them to make them uh, not disintegrate in the atmosphere. That was just scandalous. I know you're not a reader of the New York Times. Not anymore, no. And uh, you, you once said to me that when, when people, certain people find out that you don't read the Times, mm -hmm. you said, they look at me as though I just killed Mary's little lamb. <laughs> did I say that? You did. Yeah. So but you're getting along OK without the Times, are you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I read. Is your blood uh, pressure better? Uh, my blood pressure is better. And uh, also, um, uh, you know, the Times bothered me from the time I was a little boy with their use of the preposition on. They would say a study on something instead of a study of something. Well, on's okay, isn't it? No. <laughs> it's a study of something, not a study on something. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, other things like that which really bothered me. But yeah, st um, Study on is yeah, not so great, is it? Oh, and they, they, the way they use that preposition and others. But but uh, I... That's hardly the greatest of the New York Times' offenses. That's, that's true. Maybe the least of them. I think I once heard, I know I once heard you say, the culture is a sewer. And you said this with some passion and um, sadness. The culture is a sewer. Has become that. Do you mean the movies, popular music, television, all the above? Yeah, well, I mean, for instance, the, in the, the uh, pornography industry is much bigger than the film industry. And the film industry is much bigger than the entire publishing industry. Sometimes the film industry resembles the pornography and industry. And there has been a bleed from one to the other. Uh, you're in Los Angeles, you have a bigger industry than the film industry, which also makes f videos, I guess. Uh, and uh, there are personnel there, and there's a, there's a particular ethos, and it, it has bled I into it. The, the culture itself suffers from effect, uh, sensory effect. If you look at movies, the regular movies, um, you see all the special effects and the, the, uh, the sound, the noise, the, the visuals, the computer-generated stuff. And it's, that is literally sensationalism in the literal sense of the word. It appeals to the sensations of people. If you do that, you will deaden the rest of people. It's like being a Sybarite, but in a, on a different plane. Uh, and this, this is very, very unfortunate. Uh, television has largely followed suit. I mean, look, look at we. Uh, I used to say to people, uh, I don't like most movies because I am just not enthralled by uh, car chases, orange explosions, and jiggling breasts. What kind of explosions? Orange. They're all orange. Oh, the color orange. Yes. Ah, right. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, uh, that's that's largely and now it's special effects people turning into other things and uh, you know strange odd sort of drug-induced special effects 
that's, that, that stuff doesn't uh, carry it for me. And um, the uh, television is much like, look, what do people watch on television? Shows about dead bodies, you know, decaying bodies. Uh, do you write screenplays? I wrote one once, uh, Winter's Tale. Uh, Columbia paid me to write the screenplay for Winter's Tale. And I wrote it, and uh, they budgeted, what was it at the time? It was, I think, $32 million. It was 30 years ago to make the film, which is a lot of money. It was a ma major, big production. I wrote the screenplay, and I went down to Los Angeles. They put me up at the Bel Air Hotel, where in 1986 or 7, a, a bran muffin cost $12. See, so in today's dollars, it'd be like $25 for a bran muffin. I called okay. them up and I said, I can't eat here. There's no restaurants around here. and I can't eat here because it's too expensive. They said, no, just have anything you want. Have anything you want. So I ordered a lobster and everything. And they had three midgets came to my room, literally midgets, and stood there. It was like Louis XIV. And they, they served it to me. I sat at the table and there was one here and one there and one in, in back of me. And they would bring me stuff to eat, and I would eat this. And the meal cost in today's dollars about $1,000 for dinner. Now, when you say midgets, do you mean short people? Yes, you mean the three oh. men who were midgets. Midgets, not short, midgets. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, uh, I, I went to, the, to Columbia Studios. We were going to sign the papers. The movie was going to go into production. I was going to get the money, et cetera, et cetera. And I was sitting in the office of this kid who was some vice president or something. Before we went into David Putnam's office, he was the one who was the head of Columbia at the time, and he was going to do it. And so the office was lined, the walls were lined with white mink. Uh, white what? Mink. Mink? Mink. Like fur. Fur, yeah. Jeez. So we're sitting there before we sign the contract, and Jane Fonda pops her head in the door and says, uh, hi, guys. Uh, would you mind if I went in to see David just for a second? So being gentlemen, we said, oh, please, go, go right ahead. And also, it was Jane Fonda. She said, go, go ahead, go ahead. How'd she look? Gorgeous? She looked pretty good. You know, mm -hmm. she's more or less my age, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure that young people think that she's uh, way over the hill, but I think she looked pretty good. I always liked her, not her politics, but I liked her. And that, yeah, me too. And was able to separate. She's a great actress, you know. So, uh, so, so we said, you know, go right ahead. So she went in, and 10 minutes later, she came out, and she said, David's been fired. Or I think she said, can't, I don't remember. And he was. And there went my film. No, no film. No money, no film. Goodness gracious. Do you have a, not that you have to share it with us, but mentally, um, do you have a list of books you want to write? Yeah, I do. Uh, a lifetime achievement uh, list. I mean, well, however long I live, yeah. and you never know. Um, uh, I, I just finished a novel that uh, is um, going to be probably published, come out next year. But next I have uh, at least one more novel, uh, one book about uh, defense and security policy, and a book of short stories. After that, I don't know. Oh, yes, and possibly a book about uh, essentially a, um, about strategy, about strategic assessment. You said that your books are, are prayers in a way. And there, there's often a consoling quality about your books. Redemptive. Uh, did, when I was... You want, in, you want your books to, to uplift people or improve them somehow or make them feel better in addition to well, I don't, interest them, entertain them? I don't plan it that way, but uh, I, would, I would hope so. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, there was this, a book, I think it was written by a, a, a poll, I, I don't remember, it was a, a criticism book about Shakespeare. And uh, uh, it made the point, that it was, I think it was called something like Shakespeare's Redemptive Heroes. Mm -hmm. And it made the point that all of Shakespeare is in the end redemptive, one way or another, uh, which you could uh, also conflate with uplifting, uh, too. Uh, in, in other words, the, 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 the convention and the ethos and the aim of what I do is not similar to that which is the accepted convention, ethos, and aim of the modern novel as it has evolved. I'm, I'm not interested in showing pathology and uh, being uh, cynical about things and, and showing how wise I am because I know the world is a horrible place. I still believe that it's not. One more quick one, which we do a whole hour on. You think that romantic love, real, proper romantic love, and marital love is going down the tubes 
and has been trampled on, certainly in our culture. See this in your writings. Yeah. Well, it cannot be forever because it's, it's, it's part of human nature. It's just like in, the, in, the, in 1984, it existed even though it was oppressed. You, 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 biologically, in terms of, of our evolution as a species, this is essential to human nature and it will never ever be suppressed. But it's being maltreated now because of people who have strange ideas which overrule their nature, their, own, their very own nature. Uh, and uh, I, don't, uh, I don't like that. And by the way, the, the novel that I just finished is essentially a love story. Uh, it's funny that you should mention that because that's what it's about. It's about people who are really deeply in love and have to overcome the, all the obstacles that are, that are put in, 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 in front of them because of that. Thank I you. think we're beginning to run out now yeah. of uh, blood sugar. Okay. And tape. Thank you for joining us on the Human Parade. We've been talking to Mark Helprin, an extraordinarily satisfying and enlightening thing to do. I'm Jay Nordlinger, and I'll see you later. Thanks a ton, Mark. I appreciate it. Okay. Now, I take it you will edit this down, right? right. When you say my name, it makes me feel royal, like Obama. No. <laughs> you should be used to it. You all ready? It's okay, don't worry, relax. I haven't relaxed since about 1983. Right. <laughs>